Okay, um, I'll just show a few cases to start. I didn't load the other ones, but um, let's see here. Jeff? Yes. What's the, what does this talk about cobalt? Was that associated with um, with vaping? I just came in yeah, after it, the conversation. It was the one case that I showed that uh, we, we finally published in a, I, I'll forward it to you. It was finally published the, from our pathologist in more detail of the giant cell interstitial pneumonia. And they had sent the vape pen to Hopkins to be analyzed, which is where the, the traces of cobalt came. Got it. Thank you. I don't know what's going on with these images. It's like, like random radiographs add mixed in here. All right. Um, all right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So this this was a kind of a I was a little bit surprised by this case. Um, so this is a actually at the moment you're, you're I'm, I'm just seeing white. Uh, no, now it is now. Yeah. All right. So this guy, um, older guy, has a history of bladder cancer. Um, he was treated with BCG about 18 months before and um, ultimately went on to have like full on chemotherapy and a resection and all that. Um, and then he presented with some shortness of breath and this CT scan, you see this pleural effusion. And then there's all these little tiny nodules kind of everywhere. Some of them are along the fissures, but a real good example of a miliary pattern. You know, when I saw the bladder cancer history, I was very excited. I thought this might be BCG, but not 18 months later. And he's been on chemo. So well, the other thing I thought about was, was this, especially around here, is this miliary fungus. You know, his, immune, his white counts, was his counts were down a little bit. So, you know, around here we could see histo, occasionally blasto. He hadn't traveled anywhere, so I don't think it was coxy. And of course, miliary mycobacterial infection. And then we did include metastases as a possibility. Uh, he ended up getting a biopsy, and this was actually all METs. And I was surprised because at the time of the scan, he had had a scan maybe two months before that showed nothing. So these had developed rather quickly. And, you know, I've seen very few cases of true miliary metastases. I don't, you know, it's always talked about in the differential, but usually the nodules are a little more heterogeneous. There's some big, some small. These... I mean, you could you could put this on the talk as Miller TB, and I don't think anybody would blink. So anyway, I just you know, I, I it's one of those things. It's you know, I think it's one of the better examples of Miller metastases. But I was I thought it was going to come back as histo or something because you know ID was down here and we were going back and forth because no one was really thinking tumor because you know he had mostly responded in the abdomen and so it was a little unusual. So it must be some clone that or you know, mutant clone that is chemo resistant and blew up. Okay. Yeah, how, about, how about some MIPS on this case? That would that might bring this out nicely. Yeah, I can do that. I thought I saved it. I must I don't know if I exported things funny or not, but here, let's do real MIPS here. But yes, good point, David. MIPS are always nice. Yeah, there you go. It's a sandstorm. No, that's, <laughs> that's very nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, Here's another case. So this is a 53-year-old uh, patient who underwent a heart transplant. And just for a routine clinic visit, this mass popped up in the course of a very short period of time, a few months, very well circumscribed. Let's so find the right lateral. There it is on the lateral. So, and I think he was about three or six months out from his transplant. Everything had been going well. So, you know, we raised the question of PTLD, which would be good for a well-circumscribed mass. Uh, he got a CT scan to further characterize the mass. And there it is. It's, you can see, pretty homogeneous. It's near an airway. There's a couple of vessels passing around it, but it doesn't really have a lot of mass effect. There's some vessels near it. So we, we favored this being PTLD and then gave a differential of an opportunistic infection, particularly like cryptococcus, given that sort of thing. He'd been on coverage for the usual suspects, so, um, you know, aspergillus, they're usually on voriconazole early on, so aspergillus was un, un, unlikely. So he got a biopsy, and David, you want to guess what this showed? Well, the way you set it up, PPLD, but um, crypto or no cardia? It was no cardia, yeah. The one we, that seems to always sneak in there. And, you know, we don't see them much anymore because a lot of times they're on Bactrim for pneumocystis. 
but um, yeah, it ended up being just a single focus of Nocardia, but I, I've i seen mass like Nocardia, but I've never seen it this clean looking. I mean, it was just so, kind of, it's just a blob hanging out. It's not really, you know, angry looking around it. So I don't know if it's a Nocardia abscess or what, but that was a Nocardioma. Okay, so Jeff, his transplant was, again, I missed it. Was it lung or heart? It was heart. 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 Okay. So, you know, pretty heavily immune suppressed. But, yeah, and he was far, he was recent enough that he was pretty immune suppressed. Okay, next case. This <laughs> is a young man who presented with recurrent um, infection and then had this radiograph. The most recent one shows this multi loculated collection here in the left lung and the lateral. There's the lateral. You can see multiple fluid levels involving a big portion of the left lower lobe, so something very complicated here. And he got a CT scan to look at that, and you can see he's got this very ugly looking thing with some um, pleural fluid around it and all of that. But what's important is in this case, uh, we have contrast on board, which we don't always give for things like this. And you can see some lung in there, but what's important is to follow these vessels here. And you can see there's a arterial systemic artery coming in that quickly bifurcates. And uh, there was another one somewhere, maybe it's down low. Yeah, there's another one right here. And then there's a third one right there. So this is a monster of a sequestration with three wow. systemic arteries. I don't think I've seen one with three before. And it's all infected. So he actually got this resected and indeed it was a sequestration. There may be a CPAM component in there, but there's really no way to tell they often coexist, but wow. yeah. but I liked it because it was big, it was infected, and honestly, I've never seen that many systemic arteries. But it's important for the surgeons, and there's some nice lymphadenopathy to go along with it, to know exactly where and how many arteries there are because um, they're little sometimes, and it'd be unfortunate to have a little bleeder that you can't find and, and coming at systemic arterial pressure. So infected intralobar sequestration with three, I'll make a MIP here too. Nice. So, yeah. Those are very nice systemic arteries, and those are clearly congenital arteries and exactly. not neovascular artery that might accompany inflammation, such as with bronchiectasis right. or something. It's not a pseudo sequestration. It's really important to to show this and say this is clearly a congenital thing because those are congenitally installed arteries, right? Not neovascularity. For a long time, the AFIP for about ten years, they were promoting the fact that so-called intralocal sequestration was actually all acquired disease from inflammation. And that, that is bogus as shown by cases like this. Right, those are pseudo sequestrations in my opinion. I think uh, we've shown a couple of those where you get tons of little spidery feeders off intercostals right. and- Little irregular things, things, right. Because right. I've seen sequestrations where the artery is bigger than a, a mesenteric artery. I mean, clearly that's a congenital artery and not a neovascular right. artery. Yeah, but anyway, I thought that was a fun case too. So um, if there's time, I can try to dig up the other ones. All right. So who wants to go next? I have a couple. Go right. ahead. So um, I have just a, just a single image to show you on, on this case here. This is from a, uh, an iPhone. Um, this this uh, is a young fellow, I think maybe 30 years old at this point, and he... Um, had surgery as a child, as an infant, because of congenital aortic stenosis. So he's being followed up now when he's around 30 and he does have some heart failure, but he's got this, this is a contrast study, but this is all calcium. So we've seen this on non-contrast studies too. He's got this bizarre calcium at the edge of the chamber. It's hard to tell. I mean, I think it's probably sub endocardial rather than, um, you know, internal to that. But I just, I was hoping actually that Seth could participate in this too, because um, we don't have a good explanation for this sort of calcium. It doesn't look like um, the calcium that you would get, say, in after a myocardial infarction and in thrombus in the apex. But it's really, it's quite extensive. I'm only showing you one cut, but it's there on a lot of these things, this clumpy calcification. So our, uh, one of our cardiologists who uh, reads, reads cases in our, Department Dr. Krieger thought that this could be uh, advanced fibroelastosis, which does accompany congenital aortic stenosis, evidently, 
And if there were a lot of, enough degeneration in that, it could have dystrophic calcification. So that's his best explanation. But I want to ask, I told him I would show you guys and see if you had any other suggestions for clumpy calcification like uh, this along the that's what I think this is fibroelastosis. We've had a okay. couple of cases not not calcified to this degree, but we've had a couple of patients with congenital aortic stenosis that ended up getting essentially like myocardial stripping of the endomyocardium. And they often have profound delayed enhancement. Uh -huh. And so I would I would assume it could progress to calcification. Okay. Wow. So you say they required stripping because it was of the diastolic dysfunction and stuff? Yeah, it was done at an, in one of them in particular, it was done at an early age around the time that they repaired the aortic valve or maybe simultaneously. Okay. So what's the mechanism? Do you have any idea what would cause fibroelastosis with that in that setting? I don't, I don't remember. I, I know it's related to the aortic stenosis. and I, I can't remember. I just remember the association with severe congenital aortic stenosis. Okay, fine. I will. Uh, I'll relay that, and maybe I can. I'll send out the uh, the whole case as a uh, uh, in a, a better yeah. study, I'll more more cuts, and ask Seth to chime in too because he's he's seen practically everything. I think. Okay. Yeah, guys, exactly. I'll, he's probably seen it at AFIP too. Um, yeah, I, I I know I have one from a couple years ago that I showed that's on my server. I'll try and pull it up. Okay, but it was uh, it was sans calcification though, right? Correct. Without Okay, got it. Okay, let me show you some other cases here. Um, so this is a this is an example of uh, an LOS or flap. I don't know whether you guys have heard of that sort of procedure uh, before, but this this fellow has he had a, a chronic empyema and a bronchopleural fistula related to tuberculosis, and he had insert he's Vietnamese and in Vietnam. He had this procedure called LOS or flap, or LOS or flap performed, which basically opens the pleural space to the outside. And there's a big channel, there's a big hole in the chest wall down here that uh, communicates freely. And the idea was to, since you couldn't control pleural effusion in these chronically infected spaces, the best idea was to drain it and then have it have the tissue granulate in. And eventually it might fill this, and then later you could go back and try to fill the space with say muscle, a muscle flap or something like that. So this is an LOS or flap. There's a similar procedure called a Claget window. Uh, and I think they differ in subtle ways such as the size of the orifice that's created. Here's what it looks like on uh, CT. Have you guys seen these before? I've seen a few of them. Yeah, for the same reasons, chronic, usually bronchopleural fistula and chronic empyema. Right, so here's the opening and you can see that they, they've got some spongy material in there. Sometimes I've seen like iodine soaked gauze packing this the space. And then you see that the, you see that his disease is really quite complex because medial to this communicating space is a walled off space here in the pleura. So we've got this big pleural collection here medially hmm. of uh, persisting gunk. And then up up high he's got pretty collapsed lung like this. So he's, he's not getting much function out of this right lung at all. Um, and so he's got two compartments here. He's got the LOS or flap compartment that's open. He's got this other compartment here, which I don't, I don't know what they're planning to do with. It's dramatic here on coronal. You see the big open space. You see the collapsed um, lung up above and then the plural space down here that still has gunk in it and stuff like that. So he's getting it. He's come, he's come in for some sort of revision of all of this. I'll have to check out the notes and see what they're planning to do with this space. But they he came in for a revision or a redo of his LOS or flap. Perhaps they're trying to get communication with this other space here to get more thorough drainage. But rather dramatic. Yeah. One can anticipate that you don't want to be the surgeon. What? I'm sorry. You don't really want to be the surgeon because the amount of pleural thickening in that hemithorax is extreme right. and the ability to dissect and do anything must be really daunting. Right. I don't think they're going to try to try to remove this, but they're probably just try to get the space, maybe put some vascular tissue in there like muscle or something like that to basically fill up the space so you don't have, and then be able to close off this thing down here so that you've got a good blood supply and you're not going to have any spaces for infection to take hold. 
Okay, um, let's see what else we have. So, um, <clears throat> um, Travis shared a case um, of uh, atrial calcification earlier this week. So, I wanted to show you this case that Sadakar published a few years ago of the typical kind of, uh, well, an extraordinary example of the typical kind of calcification you see in the left atrium in the setting of rheumatic heart disease. So, this person had severe mitral stenosis has this very calcified left atrium here from this rheumatic heart disease. And on front of you, you can see that the, the left atrium is actually border forming. It actually sticks out beyond the right atrium here. So when your left atrium gets really big, it can become the so-called right heart border. And, and if you're trying to distinguish on a chest radiograph, which is which, which is the border forming chamber, you can uh, you can use the uh, pulmonary arteries versus the superior vena cava. So if the pulmonary arteries, the hilar structures, are being pushed out, that's a posterior effect, and that means that it's the left atrium that's going out there. If the right atrium is going out there, it'll push the cava out with it. So you can follow the superior vena cava into a, a border forming right atrium. In this case, the cava goes to this inner contour here. So this is a double density, but it's inverted and the left atrium is actually sticking out beyond and it's elevating those hilar structures at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is a right atrial, uh, sorry, left atrial calcification in the setting of rheumatic heart disease. So with, um, with Travis's case uh, that he sent around, you know, the other consideration that was brought up was chronic renal failure. And that's the only th other thing I could find in a quick search for le left atrial calcification. Um, so this is one of the most dramatic uh, cases I've seen. And so here's what it looks like on, um, on CT. So it, now do you believe me? I mean, it's really, it's, it's dilated and calcified and it's border forming, okay? So I always encounter skepticism until I show a CT scan. Not with this group, of course, but in general. Okay, so uh, rheumatic heart disease, Sadaka's case of um, left atrial calcification. And here's another Sadaker case. Um, I think this is the one. This fellow uh, was an aluminum welder. And Jeff, mm. you showed a case several years ago of aluminosis with this um, material, it's a, some sort of mineral in these, in these lymph nodes here. And it could be the aluminum itself. It could be, could be calcium. It could be calcium salts uh, or, or something like that. But at any rate, this you showed the same sort of phenomenon here of very dense nodes. Now his lungs were are, you know, this is an outside study. It's not, of course, up to our standards. And there's just a hint of of small airways disease in this person. There's a there's a little nodule sitting on here, maybe a little intraparenchymal node or something. But it just looks slightly stippled as if there could be some small airways disease. These are, I think, three millimeter slices. I don't have anything finer than that. But the man had a lung biopsy and um, uh, uh, on the right, and it showed that he had a diffuse uh, organizing pneumonia pattern. They did electron beam study of that, of that organizing pneumonia, and they found aluminum. There was a big spike for aluminum in it. So it was an aluminum-induced um, organizing pneumonia that must have been sort of diffuse at the small airway level uh, based on the CT findings. So uh, this is aluminosis, and he did have respiratory disease, which is hard to see on the CT, but was real clinically and was established as organizing pneumonia with aluminum as its cause by electron beam. So David, the case, I, another case I showed a couple of years ago was a alveolar prognosis from an aluminum, a, a lady who worked in a, a door factory that made aluminum doors. And she she presented because her, her co-workers told her not to come back until her chronic cough went away. But I think this is the case Sudakar showed at the uh, RSNA yesterday. It was a nice case. Yeah. He showed the, the, he showed the uh, element analysis with this, the aluminum peak. But the dense right. lymph nodes, yeah, I, I have a case of the dense lymph nodes. Uh, I, and I think, yeah, I think, you, I think there's some nice ground glass central lobular nodules in here too. You, you would agree that it looks oh, yeah. a little air. You go up yeah. higher, especially. There, there's, that's not normal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, those are, those are my Excellent. Guys. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Howard, you want to go? All right.
I can tell David right now that he's going to uh, like this case. So this person comes in, this goes back to March, and I only became aware of this relatively recently, but clearly there's a very extensive pulmonary process in the right lower lung. It's associated with cavitation. So certainly one initially would diagnose most likely an extensive necrotizing process, particularly a necrotizing pneumonia. And let me show you the CT from, yes, the same day. So I'll go right down here. And of course, a very extensive cavitary process in the right lower lobe. I'll come back to that area. So I want to show you that there is a lot of spread of the bad stuff from it to other portions of both lungs. And now let me go back down here. And at this point, I know David's going to wait, want to say something about the appearance of the opacities in the right lower lobe about that large area of cavitation. David? <laughs> um, birds? I mean, not normal. Birds? Definitely not normal. So it's a, it's a very dense ground glass. So if there's a little little reticulation on top, a little crazy paving pattern on top of it. Um, but if but, all of this looked like this, initially before it capitated out, this would be a pretty oh, good bird's nest. Bird's nest, wouldn't it? Yeah. So Very this is nice. this is beyond beyond bird. Uh, the bird yeah. would come out. Right. Yeah. Wow. It's got that appearance of tremendous uh, necrosis, but a bird's nest phenomenon, in the sense at least that there is, all well, the opacity, but disordered aeration, there's still aeration right there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe before the cavitation, this would have been kind of a bird's nest sign. Right. Of course, like the extreme por portion, a uh, version of it. Okay. So this turns out to be a person that is not a person with a cancer, is not immunocompromised by virtue of treatment for a cancer. She is also not a person that's post-transplantation. So she's not immunosuppressed in that sense. But here is the clinical context. So you can see that there. And interesting is that from the medical record, Reportedly, the patient has a history of pica and has been consuming dirt. So this is mucormycosis. Wow. Okay. And, and are we going to connect up that with this and diabetes? Isn't that interesting? Pretty right. bad, isn't it? That's a pretty high A1C. <laughs> yeah. So this wow. poor individual. You know, I have ended up in a really bad way. Yeah, I have a case of rhizopus, which is also in the mucor family, that looks just like this with the very large cavity in the middle. And what's interesting is that an airway going through it, Howard, that like is preserved. Okay. Almost looks like a bronchus, or maybe it's just the fire of the lung is preserved there. But yeah, I, they seem. To, you know, I think we usually catch them before they cavitate. But you, it makes you wonder if the center of the bird's nest is sort of the pre-cavitary, or the impending cavitation. It is it, one of like necrotic. You, you guys have told me that I think before that the pathology correlate of that central lucency is uh, is necrosis, is lung necrosis. So, and in this case, it looks like it spread through the airways because there was some airway-centered stuff. So. That's a beautiful case. Wow. But I don't That's think it's right. a core One. the lungs in a non like transplant leukemic kind of patient. Yeah, no, they treated for that. Pardon? I've got a question. What about a semi invasive fungal infection in this case? How long has this been going on? Because you know, I know I showed that case a couple of years ago, the semi invasive aspergillus, and it looked very similar. And it was more of an indolent course, but you still have those, like essentially vessels and whatever connective tissue stroma in the center that's left behind. Yeah, I don't know. 
what what happened to her and how long is this you um, know? what i'm not showing you is the follow-up that i read the other day so she actually is doing okay and in this region the cystic space is gone and there's just a large a large parenchymal scar here with architectural distortion but it's healed up just to leave a big scar here wow i guess technically Since chronic necrotizing fungal infections better than semi-invasive but i wonder especially since she's not neutropenic, if that's more likely in this case. Yeah, so she's actually, the rest of the lungs look okay, just a huge scar down here. This is what's present now. So you're saying it's necrotic, but not, not necrotic from angio invasion, but just... Yeah, at least in the setting of, of aspergillus, when you have that, the the so-called semi-invasive aspergillus or chronic necrotizing aspergillus, is that really what this is? You know, just with a different fungal species? Because those are typically in patients that have immunosuppression like diabetes is, you know, is the classic uh, setting for that rather than profound acute neutropenia. Right. But mucor can also invade blood vessels like as aspergillus can and can right. produce vascular occlusions and necrosis, so it could be multidimensional, yeah. Let me show you an interesting case that's kind of similar. So here is a person with also an extensive necrotizing process in his right lower lobe. Now, I believe that there is no direct causal relationship between the extensive pleural disease with calcification that's present there. But now in this person that's acutely ill, certainly when you look at that, it looks like a really bad, another really bad necrotizing pneumonia. So consolidation, cavitation, fluid levels, the lung is just falling apart and involves the superior segment of right lower lobe. So now, scrolling through here, even though these findings dominate, here's an interesting finding, which one could go by, which is, turns out to be interesting, right here. Right there. So let me bring alongside it the coronal, and I'll just go Alt double click so I can go right to that area. Here it is. Let me bring in that coronal alongside it. And I'll do the same thing. Alt double click so we go right to that. There it is. Looks like a pork rib, a baby back rib. So what does that look like to you guys? Is it a, a, a canine tooth? It's his tooth. Good for you. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. In a so Here's the history. Very sick. Doing okay. Acute ill, really bad. And then, where was that history? Right there. He's been in, in multiple accidents. He's got heel fractures, maybe the calcification of pearl thickenings from one of those. And then he swallowed some teeth. Previously had his lung deflated with a chest tube. I don't know what that is, but they were unable to get the tooth. So there it is. But that's got a, a tooth in his airway. So because this is really severe, they, they actually took him to surgery. So here I'll show you that they took that lobe out. This turned out to be, by the way, Klebsiella is what they got. Interesting. And here is a description of the right lower lung, and here is the pathology with the tooth right there. Another crazy case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be incidental, but he's got the tooth there and it's obstructing an airway. And so, you know, I've seen Howard, is the notion that this uh, aspiration of the tooth was uh, years and years ago, or was it years ago? Yeah, years so it may ago. not even be related, but I don't know. I just want to tell. But apparently years ago, it says 15 years ago, he was in a motorcycle wreck, swallowed some tea. Yeah, that's the history. 
That's impressive. <laughs> well, maybe it's not related because this is a really bad pneumonia, isn't it? Gee. Yeah, it's got to be related. Looks like there's no subjective stuff. How are you doing chest radiograph? Oh, yeah. So let's see. Um, so, no, I mean, we just have bedside radiographs. So, buried in there is. I certainly can't perceive that now. You can see it just lateral to the right atrium. Yeah, right there. But, you, you right. Know, but prospectively, no. no. <laughs> Yeah, if you know exactly where to look, sure. Yeah. Okay, let me show one more case. That's interesting. Go fast. This one will be quick. Um, Incisive, right. Um, this is a, an interesting case. Um, I can't remember the context precisely, but you can see the patient has a tracheostomy. I don't know the nature of the, of the disease, but already here one can see that there is mucus or aspirated material or mucus in an airway. And then when we go down here, you can see there is a fair amount of intraluminal material, presumably the same stuff in airways in the lower lobes, but right greater than left. So there's more intraluminal material, but it's not a ton of it in these proximal generations of segmental bronchi, right greater than left. And if you look at the overall attenuation of that lobe, um, it's a little bit less generally, subtly less than the left side. But I'd like to blame these findings as the etiology of this, which is a kind of a smoke phenomenon, or at least slow flow of blood through the right lower lobe. So relative non-opacification of the right inferior pulmonary vein with contrast medium compared to the left side, just by virtue of a relatively hypoxic load, slow flow, hypoxic vasoconstriction, and and that. Anyone think that's not plausible? No, I think that's a great, great explanation. That's a nice case. Yeah, even though there's not a ton of disease there. You can see, if you scroll up higher, you can see the, the mosaic, well, the I guess the heterogeneity is not really mosaic, but yeah, look at the superior segments, the lower lobes, even, I mean, now you're not at the tip, you're far enough down that that's real. And the vessels are small yeah. too. Yeah, I wonder, Jeff, how much of, and Howard, how much of the, the difference in attenuation in the lower lobes is due to air trapping and how much of it's due to hypoxemic vasoconstriction with Right. Just less contrast in the lung parenchyma. I think it's a combination yeah. of both. It could yeah. be a combination. It might be a combination of all of those. Sure. Yeah, both in this instance. Perhaps. All of those things. Yes, I thought you'd like that. Okay, Jeff, those are mine. Awesome. All right. Uh, Peter or Travis? Sure, I have two quick ones. All right. I'll switch it over to you. Yeah, that's the number. Oh, what, what, what was that? Can you tell me specifically? Oh, it's me. You guys see my screen? Yep. yep. So I'll start off by showing the uh, 20, patient's 2014 scan. And the interesting finding here is this reticulation in the lungs. There's like reticular, nodular pattern. It looks. Um, Lymph, uh, pre lymphatic in distribution and okay. put it on lung windows on uh, soft tissue windows. So it looks like so, just small foci of calcium. There's one so bigger so uh, focus right there. It, it and so then I'll show the CT that I read um, on October 23rd, last so a few weeks ago. Okay, thank you. Any other questions specifically about it? So here is his lungs. Uh, the pattern has progressed. Yeah, yeah. It's worse. So it's kind of similar to perilymphatic distribution, but the reticulation is worse. Uh, and then if we put it on soft tissue, more calcified, more small calcified nodules. And then the other thing to notice here is uh, the heart has significantly increased in size. And then there are also secondary findings of. Uh, well, you can see right heart failure here with um, soft tissue edema, and there's a small unilateral you know, effusion. So I was worried about uh, um, a 
about amyloidosis, uh, given the combination of the worsening, slowly worsening parenchymal changes with calcium and then the increasing uh, heart size. And uh, just a few days ago, it came back as yeah, this really elevated um, light chains, this pulmonary amyloidosis. And um, show one other case of amyloid that we read uh, last week. This is a patient, this is another patient. Uh, we've been we've been following this guy with known pulmonary amyloid for many years. He has a slightly different type of uh, morphology. It's more nodular, but all calcified and scattered. But with a cyst and a few cysts. You had and a few cysts, a, a few cysts, right, yeah. So yeah. that's that. That's not uh, accidental. That's an important part of this, according to Howard. Yeah. There is a nice. There was the biggest cyst, a little bit higher. That's very nice. In that left oh, area. Oh. Right. Right yeah. there. Yeah. Isn't yeah. But the, the nodule inside it with the ossification. So that yeah. uh, dense material is actually bone. Protein, bone, and you know the idea is that it's interesting how the the cystic, if you can zoom in, that the in that particular location, that the cyst is around around the protein, calcified, ossified protein. Like you know, the idea being that macrophages are accumulating around that lesion, huge number of macrophages, mm -hmm. and the macrophages are the source of matrix metalloproteinases, and they just dissolve the lung right adjacent to that. It's that is so interesting, morphology of that. Yeah, you know, I, I've seen some cases where you really get just a ton of basal emphysema in association with these dense nodules. So you get dense nodules and then just big emphysematous spaces around them, sometimes discrete cysts, but sometimes just big patches of emphysema. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So when, in one of the papers that I've seen, they talk about the two different patterns of nodular parenchymal and alveolar septal. Is that is that would you guys think that these two are different representations of those? Like each, like this being nodular parenchymal, the other one being more alveolar septal, or is it just an overlap? Yeah, those are the two dominant forms, the, the nodules and then the alveolar septal, so-called. Um, right. Jeff has also shown some cases of just big lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum that was... Yeah. Uh, that was yeah. Massive lymph node. Well, and then, of course, there's tracheobronchial amyloid. Yeah, and I looked for that. I didn't see airways. any. I didn't see anything on the, on the airways. Really. It's usually isolated um, to the airways in those cases. We have, um, I think, two patients with that, and you know, they just kind of hang out. Peter, do you know if this patient was a smoker? Is there any other reason for emphysema in the in the upper lungs, or could we? I say actually that? don't. I actually don't know. I don't remember. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I was I was I was wondering if this is something related, but I I don't, I don't know if that's a soft call here. This like a little bit thickening here. Yeah, it's usually like just use circumferential with with tracheobronchial amyloid. I've seen like I've seen a couple cases isolated to one lobar bronchus, but typically when it's tracheal, it's the whole thing and it's very thick. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it usually is isolated to the airways. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But yours had cardiac involvement. The other case had cardiac involvement too, which yeah. So I, I recommended the cardiac MRI, for, but they haven't done it. But I'm presume I'm very uh, suspicious. That yeah, that's a, those are both fantastic cases. We, I think, over the years we've had a couple of of cystic cases with tracheal involvement too. I know Arlene showed one, and I had one. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Usually isolated. Yeah, and I, I Chris reminded me I showed one of his. You guys have better memory than I do. Um, one question I had was, do either of these patients have plasma cell dyscrasias that you know of? Uh, the sec so they're working up the second, uh, but there's a very good chance this, the, the, actually this patient with the heart, the cardiac might, might have it, but they haven't uh, okay. confirmed that, yet. but his light chains are severely yeah. elevated. So I'm not sure if it's from a dyscrasia or if it's a primary okay. amyloidosis. Um, and the other case that I have is this one. So this is actually a normal uh, lymph angiogram, but I thought it was interesting just because I uh, don't ever see these. Um, so show 
start off with the abdomen part of it. So this was a patient with uh, a chylus um, ascites. Uh, he has a history of Parkinson's lymphoma. So interventional radiology did this uh, lymphangiogram um, and then got a CT shortly after uh, to evaluate for leak for bio leak into the ascites. And so they actually injected one of the, he had enlarged inguinal lymph nodes. So they injected the lipid dial and um, you can see it here into the pelvic lymphatics as we scroll up around the level of L2, L1 is the um, cisterna chile. And then um, more superiorly, we start seeing the thoracic duct to the right of the aorta. And I'll switch to the CT, which is just a separate scan, but at the same, exactly the same time. So. So here's the thoracic duct and the expected location. It looks normal. And you can see it going into the uh, subclavian vein. And then the other thing that was the, look, that looks strange is this uh, consolidation with contrast here at the lung basis. So initially, when we first looked at this, we were was worried about uh, just a, a leak, at, uh, leak into the pulmonary lymphatics. But this is actually uh, an expected finding expected after the angi lymph angiogram uh, you get embolization so once the this uh, oil reaches into the pulmonary circulation it'll um, circulate uh, into the systemic circulation it'll circulate and uh, it gets embolized into the pulmonary capillaries so you get trapping of uh, contrast here and probably a, a, a embolism Chemical you could, pneumonitis. I think, you know, I think you could see a little bit in the left brachiocephalic vein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can uh, you can also see uh, sometimes diffuse lung disease from this, and it looks you know it looks like edema or very mild alveolar damage. So you can see stuff all over the lungs from this yeah. uh, embolize. Little little droplets get embolized. All yeah, you can place. see them all over the place here, but they're mainly at the lung bases. But, yeah. and people, people can get short of breath from this too. Mm -hmm. Is this more than normal? Or is this uh, is this about what they expect? Yeah. What do you guys have seen? Oh, I'm not sure. Far for the yeah, course. Yeah. 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 We talked to the interventional radiologists. They, they weren't really impressed. I mean, they thought it was just what you normally get the normal limits. Peter, if you can, as a favor, if you can get thin cuts in this patient, um, I'd oh, love to have that so I can teach the anatomy of the pulmonary lymphatics potentially. Yeah, I'll try to send you the. Uh, I'll try to see if I have the thin. I'll try to send the thinnest cuts then for this one. Yeah, uh, this has thin on it, but uh, let's see. Oh, that's fine. Whatever you can, it'll be okay. All right, thank you. That's a great. That's a great example there. Yeah, that's all I have. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you. Let's see who's left. All right, Travis. Yeah, I've got a few. Let me know if you hear any feedback because I'm going through my AirPods with the microphone and then through my laptop with the speaker. You sound really good. The AirPod Pros, by the way, are are fantastic and they're really good for noise canceling on my flight back from Chicago. So this is um, this is one actually I saw a case I saw yesterday brought to my attention. I'll let you look here for a moment. This is in October, a few days after cabbage. Patient gets sent home, typical, not taking a big breath, small effusions, come back, and this is their two week post op follow up. And you know this area was was pointed out and questioned whether there could be a little loculated fluid or a little pneumonia. I'll let you look for a second if there's anything else you see here in somebody who's post cabbage. Um, give us a hint. That left atrial appendage is that? in a weird spot. How about the lower sternotomy wire? Is it off? Is it? Off? I don't know, David. What do you think? Here was yesterday oh. when I saw this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, 
and what's amazing is this was two weeks post-op and and you know this is a subtle finding at that time i think there was some distraction by this finding thinking maybe the patient had pneumonia and it was another month before they came back and this is yesterday and so now you can see this is the inferior most sternal wire that's now overlying that appendage clamp and there's just this you know misalignment of all of these and so of course yeah gosh i think it was i think it was phil boisel that wrote some of the articles way back when on on radiograph detection of of sternal dehiscence and how it frequently precedes the clinical presentation and you can see here's the subsequent ct yesterday the inferior foremost wires are split or or they're they're going you know one way or the other here's that one on the left and then if i do a coronal uh, MIP, I'll show you, you'll see that, you know, not surprisingly, you know, that these things just tear through the bone. And like I always remind my residents, you're not looking for fracture in the acute setting of the wires. The wires are there to hold the bone together and they're not going to fracture in the acute setting. You're looking for this where they're just tearing through the bones. Mm. So this is a sternal dehiscence after cabbage, you know, presenting about a month and a half after, which is the you know, it could have been detected earlier. This is certainly a, pro, a, a prolonged presentation. Travis, but there was a question, is that right, Travis? Oh, it, I mean, yeah, it certainly looks like it. I mean, there's, there's, looks like there's just fluid throughout here. So yeah. and this was just yesterday. I don't think they've gone to surgery yet to debride this, but I, I suspect that will be the next radiograph I see. Was there another question? No, it's just the bone, the bone is the bone is softened by the infection, and that's why the wires tear through it. So I just that's right. I just wanted to see the orientation of that clip because it looked a little medial more than usual. And I see it on the CT, but usually they're they're I don't know the ones I've seen tend to maybe it's just our surgeons they put them in a different angle. They tend to be more superlateral compared to where that one is, but it looks fine. Jeff, I think that's a really good point, and I would say in this case it may be that the left atrium really just doesn't look that big. Yeah, you know, I wonder. You know, usually if the left atrium is all the way, or the appendage is all the way over here. Yeah. Oh. This is a crazy case. And this is an old case. And it's from, you know, way back when. And the first time I saw this, it was just in one of Rick or Brett's slide collections. And I didn't have the source images. But this is something I've never seen before, and I don't think anybody has seen since. So this guy has a little adenocarcinoma, I presume. I don't know. It was getting bigger. This is, that's not the point of this story. So he goes up, undergoes a wedge. Here's the post-op radiograph on day one, and here's the here is a post-op radiograph a few days later when he's discharged. Is there anything? That you see here. Okay, hold on. Is there something in that right upper lung? There's like a vague opacity. On the, oh, on the, up in here? On, oh. on the other one, yeah. Sure, maybe. But that's not the finding. I'll show you the next radiograph. Here's his follow up two weeks later. Is, is that the VATS port tract? There's a. Um, Oh, there's a piece of plastic right here, right? Yeah, actually, I'll show you the lateral. Ooh. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre, right? It looks like the VATS port tract, and it is the VATS port tract plus the trocar. And I, again, not going to state where this happened or, or how this got left behind, but that is what a VATS trocar looks like. I showed a case of one that fell into the chest. Yeah, this one. That one got lodged. I mean, they knew about it and were able to get it out, but uh, they did well, have a photograph of it. But that one's. This uh, one they didn't know about. Yeah. They were notified of the study. And um, this was, I guess he was asymptomatic. And then this is, you know, a year later, it's now filled with fluid. And this, it was at this time that they went in and removed it. So again, just being, you know, objective here and, and showing what a VATS port or trocar looks like when it's, you know, Travis, that behind. blob that Jeff was talking about, the big blob on that initial chest radiograph, was that, did that correspond to this thing? I think it probably did. 
no, it was, it no, was, I think Jeff was talking about. to, yeah, no, it was, it was, it's this. It's that. There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Travis, the one I have, I'll, I'll have to pull it up next week. It's much more conspicuous. It almost, it looks like a real foreign body than not just subtle. Yeah. I guess it's a different make, but. Yeah, this is, uh, right. This is some plastic or some fairly radiolucent material, but yeah, I, this, so this guy's doing great though. He's, he's cancer free. And uh, that's how I ended up seeing follow up at some point in time. But uh, yeah, retained port. Well, so so okay. Chris is making pull that one back up again because Chris is making me tell you if you look at that one, the answer is on the film where it said port. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> That's funny. On the one that, yeah, it says port right here. Port, there's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever use all your. President, you can say it, you get stuck, you can tell them the answer's on the image. Yeah, use all of your information. Nice. Rule number one, right? And, um, and no, Howard and I did not coordinate <laughs> with uh, this, this case. This is a, an unfortunate patient who came in last month, and you can see he has a recently instilled pick. His radiograph at this time looks okay. He undergoes treatment, gets he has not been transferred to us yet, and you can see the pick is still in, and he's developing something here. This is the CT that was done at the outside hospital, and as I said, Howard and I did not coordinate, but we can see Wait. this area of non-enhancing or hypo-enhancing lung with peripheral consolidation, it's almost halo and a reversed halo in the same patient. So a little bit of, you know, certainly looks like it could be an angioinvasive fungal infection. And he is somebody who has AML and is now has a neutropil count of zero at this point in time. So this was, you know, raised the possibility of pneumonia and they had the patient on broad spectrum antifungals, but I think they were thinking aspergillus Oh, when he got when he got transferred to us, I said, "No, this looks like mucor." This was when we saw him a few days later, and we I looked at that outside CT. I was like, "I think this is mucor." Get a repeat CT, and at this point, this is what we have: all of this, and you still have that that bird's nest look. It hasn't developed the central necrosis, but this entire area. Not only that. I don't know. There's there's mass effect, and I don't know if there's even frank invasion into the into the vena cava or into the right atrium. But this whole area, I was worried about as being just a massive area of of mucor. And um, so it in it was around this time that they got the study that they started him on on broader spectrum antifungal specifically for mucor. And unfortunately, it was too late, and he passed away a couple of days after this. But the, um, oh, where's my thing? And I just put this up, but so this also grew a rhizopus species. So rhizopus is the genre and it is of the, either the class or order mucorales. I don't remember which one it is, but it is a mucor species. So this is a case of mucor. Yeah, the, the case I showed about three weeks ago was also the same microsporous species. Um, and it was a baddie, it was a, another nice yeah. bird's nest like this. Yeah. So, and yeah, it's, it's, you know, and it's, I mean, it's correct to say this is infection. I think that once you see what looks like a reverse halo and, a, and an infarct that you have to be specific for, you know, that this could be mucor yeah. so that they put them on or they're more aggressive with the therapy. And I don't know if it would have made a difference at this point in time, but this guy was never a surgical candidate as this was involving the right middle and the lower lobes probably. Probably maybe an incomplete fissure here. I don't know. Well, if the neutrophil kind of zero, I don't think it matters with how many drugs. Yeah. You have it's, yeah. And this, right, this was his presentation. So this was a, a acute presentation, AML, no, this wasn't a relapse of anything. This was just his first presentation. And here you can see right at time of presentation, there's nothing. I think that, you know, the lack of enhancement on your contrast CT in the presence of thing, I think supports the angio invasion and the, uh, basically mm -hmm. part long. it's just not enhancing at all no it's not and and 
this outside study is is thicker sections, but sometimes you'll even, you know, and we've shown this, and I think David, you've shown it too, just that you'll see abrupt cutoff of the pulmonary artery, like a macroscopic mm -hmm. know, invasion of the pulmonary artery. Could happen. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, good call. I will. It's an infection special week. I, and and iatrogenesis imperfecta over here. <laughs> All so, right. Well, talk to you. Thanks, next everyone. Time. Yeah, have a great week. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Have a good week. Thanks, everyone.